This is the story of three brothers whose remarkable vocal harmonies brought them international fame. This is the story of the Bee Gees. Twin brothers Robert and Morris Gibb were born on the Isle of Man in the north of England in the second half of the 1940s. Our father was a drummer for 30 years, and our mother a band vocalist, and that's how they met. And that's how we were thought of. The boys grew up as rock and roll music was beginning, but in Britain the closest most performers came to making music was miming to hits of the day. The Gibb brothers were no exception, but a broken record changed everything for them. This was the city of Manchester in 1956. Actually, how we started is a story in itself. We'd always loved singing around the house, and uh, there was a cinema nearby where we were able to stand on stage and lip sync to records. We called ourselves the Rattlesnakes then. Normally, we'd have a chance to rehearse the record, rehearse lip-syncing to it, and be ready. But that day, there was no turning back. So we had to go on stage, and we had to sing for real. And I can tell you now, looking back, we were pretty young, pretty hungry, but we found out we could sing. was on the way to the cinema we broke the record that we were going to mind to and uh, we'd been practicing singing at home we found out we had an actual harmony but uh, we didn't understand what we were doing and uh, we decided at that point to sing instead of mine in about 1958 we emigrated to australia and um, went to live in brisbane the Gibb family had rarely remained in one place for long, but in 1958 they took a much bigger step, like so many intrepid Britons of the era, by emigrating to Australia. Upon their arrival in this young country, the brothers quickly began to display their musical talents in public. I think we probably had pretty much what, what any artist has if they start as young as we had and work your way up to where you get in life. We went through all the small clubs, all the small hotels, any television work we could get. It was three kids with a guitar, you know. But everything was very young in Australia. Show business was very young, even in the world that we were in, uh, the, our particular area of the show business world. I mean, TV was young, the uh, recording industry was very young, um, publicity people were very young. Very there wasn't young. Publicity people were very old. <laughs> but, but they had no idea of how to sell an artist or anything like that, because it was yeah. all very young business, you know. But we, we spent most of our time working to adults. Yeah? yeah, well, we were very young kids at the time, and we weren't a major recording group. Kids so don't sell records. Don't sell records. We had about 13 flops in a row. <laughs> Even so, the Bee Gees, as they were now known, were regarded as a phenomenon, to the extent that they were featured on television performing one of those early flops, The Battle of the Blue and Grey, in 1963. Well, I'm an old man now, and I'm born with a grace. People won't believe me, but there's truth in what I say. Nothing more to say, but I'd do anything if I could do 
Understandably envious of the excitement surrounding the Beatles and many other groups back in Britain, the brothers decided to return to their own country in 1967. Ironically, as they left, they were finally achieving chart success with a timeless song entitled Spicks and Specs. Number one single in Australia the week that we left Australia. Where is the sun that shone on my head? The sun in my life, it is dead, it is dead. Where is the light that would play in my streets? And where are the friends I could meet, I could meet? The girl that I love, she is gone, she is gone. The Gibb family sailed back on the line of Fair Sky, with the boys and their father working their passage by entertaining on board. Their immediate goal was to contact Brian Epstein, the manager of the Beatles, and his partner, Robert Stigwood. Anyway, ahead of our trip, we sent these records and acetates and things to Brian Epstein. And it was in a matter of the two weeks that we were there that uh, one night, Robert Stigwood, who was managing director that night, decided they would play these tapes and these records. So they both sat and played them. And we don't know how we got our phone number, but we phoned us up and uh, we never within the next week we'd signed a five-year no. contract. Stigwood could see the potential of the Bee Gees, who he thought could quite easily become as successful as the Beatles. He backed his confidence with heavy financial investments, which paid off when their first single, New York Mining Disaster 1941, reached the top 20 on both sides of the Atlantic. Have you seen? Before the end of 1967, the Bee Gees, including beside the Gibb Brothers, lead guitarist Vince Maloney and drummer Colin Peterson, who'd both worked with the Bee Gees in Australia, were topping the British chart with the wistful Massachusetts.
Unsurprisingly, the Bee Gees became the target for fan worship as they amassed hit after hit. Under Robert Stigwood's perfectly planned patronage, the group achieved immense popularity, enhanced by a heavy touring schedule, which often resulted in hysterical scenes. This it scares me all right, but if there wasn't any public enthusiasm, it would scare me more. We are trying to capture a wider audience, but they're then just uh, um, teenagers. The end of 1968 saw the Bee Gees returning to the top of the British chart with I've Got to Get a Message to You, which was also their first American top ten hit. the group began to collect awards from all over the world, both for sales and for their artistry. We were three kids and we knew really nothing. We were pretty green. We sang and we wrote songs and we didn't know how good those songs were. And um, it's just very, it's, it's very hard. Everyone else is in control, you're not in control. And uh, so the promotion becomes the hype and it's all built up and people put money up behind it. And we were titled as the, uh, the new... The most, the significant most significant new musical talent of 1967. Well, to us, we didn't even know what that meant. I think my head from things that I said Till I finally died Which started the whole Despite their occasional bewilderment at their vast success, the Bee Gees continued to produce memorable songs, starting 1969 with a big hit on each side of the Atlantic. I started to joke, made it big in America, while 1st of May reached the top ten in Britain. The groove for you and me I watched the apples falling one by one And I recall the moment of them all The day I kissed your cheek now we are tall and Christmas trees are small and you don't ask the time of day but you and I our love will never die although in public the Bee Gees denied rumors that the price they were paying for fame and fortune was an imminent falling apart, all was obviously not well. And I was speaking to you from a club in, uh, in Hamburg, and uh, I'm Barry Gibb of the Bee Gees. Robin here. Robin, we've heard rumors that the group is splitting up. Would you like to verify those rumors? I don't know. Thank you very much, Mr. Peterson. How about you, Mr. Maloney? Oh, no, I don't think it is. Come in, come in. No, no, no. If I was to say that was true, then I would be the premier of Russia. 
However, Robin Gibb did leave his brothers in the spring of 1969, making a solo album titled Robin's Reign, from which a single, Saved by the Bell, became a major hit. Meanwhile, Barry and Morris starred in a TV special, Cucumber Castle. Since the Bee Gees were such well-known personalities, their family feud became public property. It wasn't just Robin leaving the group. It was a whole combination of elements that were good and bad. It was like a family argument made public. It was a difficult period for all three brothers, and their rivalry was further exaggerated when Don't Forget to Remember by Barry and Morris, taken from Cucumber Castle, matched the chart performance of Robin's solo hit. That it's true I can get over anything You are my love But I can't get myself over you Robin's absence from the group was to last more than 18 months, and in the interim, Colin Peterson joined Barry and Morris on another BG success, Tomorrow Tomorrow. Eventually, Robin was reunited with his brothers at the end of 1970, inevitably at the instigation of Robert Stiglitz. They celebrated their reunion with their first American number one hit, How Can You Mend a Broken Heart? I could never see You stop the rain from falling down How can you stop the sun from shining What makes the world go round How can you mend this broken man How can a loser ever win Man, my broken heart. 
However, by 1972, the fickle nature of public taste had decided that the Bee Gees had outlived their usefulness, and the hits became smaller, like My World, and in 1973 and 1974, almost non-existent. the group were again at a low ebb and found themselves playing in small clubs in the north of England. In an attempt to relaunch their career, the brothers began to work with noted record producer Arif Mardin, who was strongly connected with their American label, Atlantic. We did two albums with Arif Mardin, yeah. a producer, record producer in New York, and uh, he's an ex excellent producer. He's like an old uncle. All, most artists look up to this man. He's like a doctor. Yeah. Not, not that we were in need of a doctor, mind you. Yeah. <laughs> You think about it. Um, <laughs> my piles were playing up. Yes, time. Robin's. Um, anyway, we won't go into that. But we made two albums. One was Mr. Natural, uh, which didn't do well at all. And uh, uh, but we, but we, us and Arif stuck together and made another album following, thinking that we were on the right track. We were making a transition somewhere. Let's see where we're going. And uh, that main course album was what uh, came. The new direction proved entirely successful, and the first hit from main course, Jive Talking, became another American chart topper in mid-1975. followed by another big hit from the same album, Nights on Broadway.
Arif Mardin encouraged the brothers to express their natural affinity for rhythm and blues. In 1975, they started doing this music that we had been doing for years yeah. prior Just to never made the record. Nobody wanted to hear that sort of music from the Beatles. But we were writing it and, and even recording it on demos, but nobody, uh, the record company that we were with before that time, uh, did not want to release Bee Gees R&B because they thought in those days it wasn't right for a white group to release that You've kind got, of music. It, the idea was give us as many ballads as yeah. you can. You see, yeah. white group just didn't do R&B music prior to 1974-75. The Bee Gees proved that musical stylings tinged with rhythm and blues and soul could be applied to ballads. One notable example from 1976 was Fanny Be Tender With My Love, which was reminiscent of the work of Curtis Mayfield. Seems like you don't want the love of this man at all And it sure been a lovely time Right up to the time I met you So if you take a love like mine Even their success with Main Course was dwarfed by what was to come. I feel you touch me in the pouring rain And the moment that you wander far from me I want to feel you in my arms again And you come to me on a summer breeze Keep me warm in your love Then you softly leave And it's me you need to share Robert Stigwood had realized that disco music was the soundtrack of the late 70s and that the music of the Bee Gees was tailor-made for the disco phenomenon. Accordingly, he used their music in a film he was making centering on New York nightlife, Saturday Night Fever, starring the then little-known John Travolta.
music and movie. You cannot plan success. Was... Nobody knows what's going to be successful. Either they've got an idea what might be successful, but nobody said it's going to be that successful. It's going to be so big, and then we're going to release the three, four singles off this album. <laughs> we're going to get four of the ten at the same time. No, no but then, yes. if I do oh, this, we have a subconscious have feeling of what we know what might be successful, yes. That's absolutely but true. But you, you can't plan it in a way a Saturday Night Fever was done. A Saturday Night Fever, uh, nobody expected the success of Saturday Night Fever had. Saturday Night Fever, Robert Stigwood hit on the idea of creating a film using the characters created by the Beatles for their classic LP, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. The movie starred the Bee Gees, of course. In contrast to Saturday Night Fever, the Sgt. Pepper film was a disaster, both critically and commercially. We knew it was a disaster. 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 We knew it was a
By now, another member of the Gibb family had achieved celebrity status in his own right. Quite a few years, there was a child around our house. We all think it's only fair that we give him a break at last. So won't you please welcome my younger brother, Andy Gibb. Andy Gibb himself was a major star at this time, having achieved three consecutive number ones. Despite their phenomenal worldwide success, the Gibb brothers were not content to simply rest on their laurels and found success writing and producing for other artists. Maybe just being an artist now is, is, is exciting, but you want to try other things. You have to try and branch out, do, find out what other abilities you have, if any. You know. See, it, it, also the and, fact uh, that uh, I like to point out too, because of being the producers and also writers, is that the reason that Saturday Night Fever, for instance, when we did the score, that we wrote the music for the for our album actually, but they used that movie, that music for that movie. So uh, we proved one thing there that we can write soundtracks for films. We don't we don't write old disco or dance type no. music. But we can write any kind. So this is the kind of thing we proved with Saturday Night Fever, which I don't think many people picked up on. For me, when I when I was asked to do Barbara Streisand, I didn't believe a word of it until I met Barbara Streisand and she said to me, this is going to work, we're going to do it. After great success duetting with and producing Barbara Streisand, Barry's most recent project involved working with Diana Ross. together, this is not prohibited solo projects. Feeling 
Although both Barry and Robin released solo records, this posed no threat to the Bee Gees as a group. Back up high, been down three times already. You know, we'll go on making our music, we'll go on believing in our music. Gees have remained together as a group on and off for over 20 years. Two decades have seen them as international stars and as forgotten has been. Nevertheless, the Gibb brothers have proved that they can suffer the ups and downs of fashion and bounce back to stardom.